Okay, now first of all, in front of you, you've got um, about seven pairs of cords and all these lights that tell you where the cows are coming from. When a light goes on, that means there's someone waiting there and you plug in and you ask them what they want. <laughs> Do your arms get tired? No. Your mouth gets tired. It's the strangest. You get tired of talking. You've you been talking for so long because you talk constantly for six hours and it's hard. Keep you know. going on this point. Well... You get to feel just like a machine. You get to feel just like a machine. And, uh, and of course, now that we look back at what Sharon was doing not too long ago, um, the job doesn't exist anymore, and it is a machine. And then you think about all these other professions today, right, that we likely will look back on, just like we look back on this role that Sharon played, um, and these will all be likely, or many of them will be done by machines as well. There's this uh, technologist named Kai-Fu Lee who came out with a book just recently about AI superpowers and, uh, and what AI will do to make new superpowers globally, like geopolitically. And there's a lot of research to suggest that 40% of all jobs will be done by AI. And, uh, and the one area that he actually says is sacred from, um, from being disrupted by AI is in fact creativity which I found very interesting, because uh, this has been sort of uh, you know, my obsession for quite some time, um, is, uh, is empowering creative careers, organizing the creative world at work, making products that help creatives be hopefully more efficient and more productive and ultimately more creative. And so I thought that this would be an interesting thing to share with you, some early thoughts around this, because I get asked a lot around about AI and about how the future of design and creativity are changing. Um, so what is the future role? of creativity and design. How is this all changing? So as we alluded to, and Vitaly was here helping us uh, save time, or you know, not notice time passing, I guess. Um, uh, Behance was, a, uh, was just a small little New York City tech uh, outfit back in 2006 trying to help organize the creative world. And, uh, and the platform is now over 18 million creatives around the world showcasing their work and getting discovered and building careers and powering their websites. And all along the way, the, the mission of Behance has been to, um, to help foster attribution in the creative world, help people get opportunity, and ultimately help um, nourish creative careers. Uh, over the years, there have been a couple books that have all been about either creative teams that are especially productive and understanding what we can learn from them, um, as well as what we can learn from the middle of bold creative journeys and how people kind of stick with it long enough to figure it out. And now in this role as Chief Product Officer at Adobe, um, I'm trying to fix a lot of things, so stay tuned. Anything that you're annoyed by hopefully will be fixed, <laughs> all right? Just trust me, there's a lot of good stuff coming. Um, but also, it's, uh, it's really about thinking around the future of a lot of these flagship segment products like Photoshop and Premiere Pro and Lightroom and a character animator and, and um, et cetera, and After Effects and how they all interoperate. Um, and also new mediums of technology, like augmented reality, virtual reality, and voice, and everything else. Um, and there is a lot of AI that we're investing in um, to help serve the creative process as well. And so I am, I am seeing a lot of this from you know, the lens through the last 15 years or so, is, uh, is, 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 is forming my opinion. And I am happy to report that I'm really optimistic for us. Um, I think there's never been a better time to be a creative. And, uh, and I wanted to share just a few thoughts uh, and, and first of all, make this argument as to why I think this is. And so I'll start with um, a, uh, a, an argument that for a long time, we've been living in this era of what I like to call productivity scarcity. So there's just more and more stuff to do, you know, more and more chords to plug in and plug out, more and more things to write and transcribe and transpose and everything else. And in order to be productive, and to be successful, we just invested in productivity. So we invested in productivity by throwing people at the problem, and we invested in productivity by finding ways to get technology to do the stuff for the people so that we could all apply our human energy, energy towards higher order tasks. But it was always about productivity. And just look about, look about uh, the, the history of Microsoft and deploying productivity apps in the enterprise. I mean, this is, this is all about capitalizing on the era of productivity scarcity. But, now we are reaching this interesting point where um, it seems that an investment in, um, or that machines are actually definitely providing more productivity gains than people, 
And in some ways, productivity is now being commoditized because there's often a machine that can do that. And when there's a machine that can do that and the costs become efficient enough, you know, that ends up being the choice of many companies and many industries. And so I think what we're doing is we're entering into this new zone that I like to call the era of creativity, where the return on creativity exceeds the return spent on incremental productivity. Because of AI especially, and these machines being so incredibly powerful, now actually an incremental minute of our time being more creative can yield more return than an incremental minute of our time trying to figure out how to be more productive. And so I would actually argue that in some weird way, creativity is the new productivity. You know, everything that we were trying to do with productivity over centuries, if not the past few decades, it's now going to shift to creativity. Instead of deploying productivity apps to everyone in every company, we're going to start deploying creative apps to everyone in every company so they can stand out. They can actually do things, express themselves in compelling visual ways, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the implications for the design community and for creatives in general? And, uh, and so I had like five or so thoughts I just wanted to throw by you and hopefully plant some seeds and, uh, and start more conversation um, after this. Uh, one of them is the fact that I think there will be you know, a million X more creators than there have ever been before. Now when you hear that, it's like, well, wait, what are all these people gonna do? How are they gonna put food on the table? This doesn't make sense. You know, what would actually be the, what would be the tectonic shifts that would enable this to happen? Three things in particular. One is the opportunity fueled by attribution. So if you think about even the power of a creative agency 10 or 20 years ago, everything that was done was done by, presumably by an agency that typically hired a smaller agency that typically engaged headhunters who typically went out and, and found the actual individual creative professionals wherever they are in the world to do the work. And did those actual people ever get the attribution for the work that they did? No. I hope that platforms like LinkedIn, Behance, Dribbble, many others are helping foster attribution where there wasn't any, and also the culture of people allow, being allowed to put stuff in their portfolios. I mean, there's a lot of things that are changing that are enabling people to far, start getting attribution and hires or people who are looking for talent trying to figure out who did what, and that's a real tectonic change um, that is accelerating. Another shift here is the opportunity fueled by distribution. I mean, think about what it took many years ago for a creative person to get their work distributed. I mean, you had to know somebody, you had to have an agent, you had to work with just a handful of studios or somehow get on TV. And now, of course, with YouTube and, and, um, and SoundCloud and, and Patreon and, and, uh, and Vimeo and, the, and Netflix and all these you know, new streaming services, I mean, there's just a plethora of, of distribution opportunities for all of us. And that is definitely expanding the opportunity for creatives in general. But the one I'm most interested in is this new change on the consumer side for more and more consumption of creativity. And if you look through your Instagram and you just notice all of these finely tuned, not only ads, but brands for you, it's just amazing how many thousands and thousands of micro brands are popping up to try to give everyone the thing that they've always wanted, like them personally. And it's not just for brands of products, it's also content. If you go to someone in the middle of the country and you look at their Netflix account, chances are they'll have different things they're watching, different things in their recommended list. There's an actual really long tail of content being created and, and, and distributed on these streaming platforms that is like very niche, very, very niche. And I think that trend is gonna continue. And, uh, and then personalized experiences. I mean, we all expect now to um, have personalized experiences uh, with the brands that we interact with, and that takes a lot of content. So I think that the opportunity for creatives is, uh, is exploding, is exploding in large part because of the consumer desire for it. I mean, there's another company that just launched out of, of, of Y Combinator called the Custom Movement, and they're basically buying new shoes. They're getting artists to customize these shoes, and then they're selling them to end consumers, and it's exploding because everyone seems to want something that is unique and customized by an artist in between. It's a great trend that I'm excited about. So another reason why um, this is all uh, the tailwind for us and the future is good for creatives is, um, is that I think AI will liberate us. Now, AI is not gonna liberate everyone. And in fact, part of this is an argument for more people that are in other jobs that are at risk to, to, to be trained in creativity and to come over to the creative disciplines in some way. But for designers and for creatives, AI is truly the wind at our back. And let me explain a few reasons why. So first of all, 
um, how many reformatting uh, tasks do we have to do for our customers, clients, or products all the time? You know, new size phones, new size screens, new size uh, different different sort of desires for responsive experiences, um, watch apps. You know, there's just so many new formats and ad sizes, and it just keeps coming and coming and coming. In which case, there's this like content velocity problem. We're all trying to keep up with essentially non-creative tasks of just reorganizing elements in order to to send them through in a different channel. And this is something that I truly believe AI should be doing for us. And there are a lot of experiments now, and there's some betas of plugins in Photoshop, for example, and other places um, that do this. We just launched something in Adobe XD called Auto Layout, which is just going to allow people to reformat um, automatically using artificial intelligence that knows where to reposition all of the attributes of a design. Uh, the, other, the other thing here is just around the mundane, repetitive labor that we do. So we've done some studies uh, in our user research team at Adobe with customers, and we firmly believe that 40 to 50% of someone's time in Photoshop is spent doing this complete repetitive mundane stuff. Whether it's masking something or doing something repeated over and over and over. Like why shouldn't the tool know that if you do this six thing, these six things in a row, and you're 99% likely to do the next seven steps, why shouldn't it just show you a preview of that and let you click that so you can then jump ahead in your process and skip all the mundane, repetitive stuff that you're doing along the way? If we do this, what happens? AI really starts to unleash our creativity because it ends up starting to uh, just kind of replace all the stuff that was just productivity stuff and allows us to spend more time on looking at something in an entirely new way, you know, seeing a mistake of the eye and following it. Uh, and, and all the other stuff that is related to genuine, you know, genuine innovation. So a third thought. A third thought is that design can no longer be siloed. And I mean this in, in two respects. You know, one in the sense that design has historically, in, in many companies, been this small team that is almost treated like an internal agency. Stuff is just thrown over the wall, or these designers are summoned to make something look beautiful right at the end. And we all know that, that the era of that is, 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 is quickly and happily slipping away. Design has become the competitive advantage of many products and services and experiences. And the smartest companies are empowering designers to work, have a seat at the table, be leaders of the company, if not the product. And, um, and so design is you know, in, in the center, which is both a opportunity as well as a responsibility. Um, it also means that, uh, that we have to rethink how to get more people included in design. So you know, the, the first part of this problem is that everyone wants in now. You know, everyone wants to look over your shoulder. Everyone wants to have a say, and that's not so comfortable. Um, what we have to think about is how do we make design, how do we evolve design to include more stakeholders, and how do the, technology, how do the tools that we actually use accommodate these stakeholders? How do you permission them? You know, how do you make sure you can have a perfect experience to work alongside an engineer? or a C-suite executive who wants to know the future of her or his product, um, uh, or a reviewer, or a copy editor, that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of tools out there thinking through this. Um, but we have to embrace these ways of working, because everyone does want a, a say. And smart companies will actually engage designers and hire designers that want to be inclusive, because that's, if design's a competitive advantage, everyone does, in fact, have to have a stake in the game to some degree. I also think that if we look forward and, we'll, and look at the best design teams in the world you know, a decade from now, they will uh, prioritize a few things uh, more than ever before. Coordination, so this idea of everyone working off of the same, uh, the same base, the same design system. I think that every design team will have a design ops group within it that is focused specifically on fine tuning the design system, making sure that it is flexible enough, it is always updated, and that people can contribute to it with ease, but also that it is, um, it is structured enough that it can really coordinate a large group of people and partners and all these stakeholders, again, that want to say. I think that the best design teams will mandate consistency across the organization. We all know that the best brands in the world are consistent. They are consistent in every format, in every place they show up, and every interaction and experience that customers have with them. And we'll get to immersive in a second, but it's going to open up a whole suite of challenges in brand consistency once we're living in this augmented reality world. And then the best design systems will also be very empowering. People will be able to join a team quickly or be an adjunct member of the team 
and get started and be successful from day one. And, uh, and that's, it's, a, it's an exciting challenge to craft this design system uh, technology that, that enables it. I mean, what we did at Adobe, instead of trying to say, okay, let's build a tool, et cetera, what we decided to do is actually solve it for our, our customer zero first, meaning us. And so a few years ago, we created this thing called Adobe Spectrum. And we actually put a whole team, including engineers and product people, on building a design system that would work across dozens of products and 20,000 people. And, uh, and that is what's given birth to things like these Creative Cloud libraries that soon will announce, interact into third party tools as well. And, uh, and, but we tried to kind of solve it for ourselves first, eat our own dog food, if you will. Um, and, uh, and we're well on our way there. Um, so another thing that we have to be excited about, but also take as a responsibility, is preparing for these new mediums ahead. And it's interesting, I have tried to better understand the history of Adobe in, in my new role there, and, it's, and on also um, just the history of digital. And it's interesting how you had this mass of graphic designers and print designers largely using Illustrator and InDesign, and this thing called the web came around. And a lot of them were like, no, 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 I'm a purist. Like, I'm not going to touch this digital, crappy UI stuff. Like, uh, you know, this is not interesting to me. And of course, we had to help a lot of designers embrace the web. And we did that through a series of technologies over the years, whether it be Dreamweaver, different products acquired through Macromedia. And then, um, and then of course, you know, web design, Web designers had to then go into mobile, and we all, some of us at least, remember when a responsive web design became a thing, you know. And then mobile apps. Then the question was, how do we adapt what we were doing on web to mobile, etc. And so these migrations happen, and it's super interesting to see the people who are the the the, the first adopters, and then the laggards, and the technologies that help people um, make the leap. So what's next? I mean, certainly. Uh, certainly voice is, is one area that we're really excited about. So um, we, we are all interacting these days, more and more at least, with voice apps of some kind, whether it be Siri or Alexa or whatever else, or asking your car to do something, um, interacting with some, some voice bot when you ask for support from some brand or whatever else. But that's like the sort of the first generation. It's interesting, it was recently explained to me that there's three major problems to solve with voice. The first is interpreting what is being said and knowing like the actual words, like translating them into, into uh, some understanding, or at least knowing the actual words you're saying. And that were like 97, 98% accuracy, and apparently human transcriptionists are about 95%. So that part is already better than humans. The last part, I'll skip to you first, is the, is, the, um, is the response, like the voice response based on what you asked. That's also pretty good these days. But the middle part of figuring out what the actual words you said really means, like what, what it actually means about your intentions. Like what are you actually asking? And it turns out that when you're being told by Alexa or something, I didn't quite understand that, it's not saying to you that they didn't understand the words you said, it's that they didn't understand your intention. Like it didn't map with something in the system that would gauge a response. And so that's the part where there's a lot of work to be done. But there are a ton of new design principles that I think are yet to be developed. In, uh, in voice, and it's one reason why the, the TDXD team actually leaned forward on the voice prototyping, because we think that there's a lot of innovation in that space to, to explore. Um, the one I'm most excited about is the immersive opportunity. Uh, I have um, been in the, in, the, in the meetings with Google and Facebook and Apple and Magic Leap and, and, and a few others, and, uh, and one thing is, Adam, is, is really clear to me, regardless of who wins and whether we're all wearing these glasses someday or whatever, this new medium will fall flat if it isn't enriched with your content. And that's always been the case for web and mobile too, right? It's when creators start to create for that medium is when that new medium comes alive. What do we know about this new medium of immersive? First of all, everything that's in it will need to be animated and interactive. Just like when we see things on the web or on mobile, we don't expect them to be animated and interactive because they're just elements. They're just elements on a page still. It might be a digital page, but it's still a page. But when you're actually interacting with 3D objects around you wearing glasses or, some, some, or holding up your phone, you're going to expect that as you approach it, it's going to start to turn or grow or do something. It's going to welcome you. It's going to be animated. And anything that sits stagnant like this you know, will just be completely boring and unusual in this world of, uh, of, of immersive experiences. The reason why I would go and say that it's going to be bigger than the web is because today we only engage with our screens when we have an intention 
when we want to do something. But when you're walking down the street with glasses, you're going to see a superimposed augmented reality experience around you at all times. So inherently, it will be much bigger than the web because it will always be a lens that we can look through and feel informed and feel guided and everything else. And so it's a really exciting space. You know, we, we launched something called Project Arrow that is how it, it's made to actually help people who are in Photoshop and Illustrator and products like that start to bring what they make into 3D and automatically um, give, it the, uh, give it the characteristics you would expect in 3D. And there's a lot more um, coming on that front. So the last thing I'll just leave you with, which I think is, um, is exciting, but is also a challenge and something that we all have to do as stewards of design and, uh, and being, uh, and especially those of us that are more senior in, in, in roles in our companies and our communities, is thinking about the next generation. Um, my goodness, you know, we, we, uh, we have an industrial revolution driven education system and, uh, and, and still, so much of design and art is, is limited to an art class uh, or some sort of thing taught one period a day or usually just one period a week in some schools. And it's just nuts to me, you know, if we know where the world is going and we know that in order for people to be successful in their careers, they're going to have to know how to stand out. They're going to have to know how to do things that are less about productivity and incremental return on their time for productivity and more for things that are creative. You know, things that make people look twice. Um, everyone in an organization is going to have to be able to make a compelling argument more compellingly. They're going to have to visually express themselves in new ways. Data is going to have to be shown through infographics in new ways. You know, this is how humans are going to stand out and have jobs. And we've got to prepare these kids. Um, so I, I like the term creative literacy because literacy has been a historic you know, uh, focal point in the curriculum of every single kid, you know, probably around the world, it's just making them literate. So creative literacy, I think, is what it's all about now. And, uh, and I think we all have to be active participants in that to uh, fight for the cause that you know, creativity may, in fact, be more important than calculus. I'll leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs>